Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Symposium 13, Updates in Spirometry and PFT Lab. My name is Blythe, and I'm a physiotherapist from Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children. I've been working in CF care for about 17, 18 years, and I'll be co-moderating with Andy Reid, who is a respiratory therapist and who's been in practice for 30 years um, at the uh, Riley Hospital for Children at IU Health. It's been a privilege working with him to help organize this session. As a reminder, the structure of this discussion is four 20-minute presentations, each followed by a five-minute Q&A. The presenter will take questions from the audience, then at the end of the presentation, there will also be a 15-minute panel discussion Q&A with all of the speakers. Feel free to use the microphone um, in the center of the room, or you can also post your questions on the app. Um, Please try to speak as clearly as possible as this session will be recorded and made available on YouTube after the conference. I'm super excited to be here today as we have four very talented speakers sharing their knowledge and experience with our audience today. And I look forward to their presentations. Good afternoon. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Daniel Weiner. He is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and an attending pediatric pulmonologist at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where he also serves as co-director of the Antonio J. and Janet Palumbo Cystic Fibrosis Center, and he is also the medical director of the Pulmonary Function and Exercise Lab. He is an emeritus member of the ATS PFT Proficiency and Standards Committee and has long-standing interest in pulmonary physiology and lung function testing. He is going to present on race and predicted results in spirometry. Welcome, Daniel. So, just click on Starling yep. here. And there's a pointer here if you want to use it. All right. And you have to click first, and then you can use the clickers on that. Okay, so uh, thanks uh, to Andy and Blythe for inviting me to talk. I'm a little bit intimidated in speaking in front of these people that probably know more about PFTs than I do, but it's uh, one of my favorite uh, topics to talk about, and I'm uh, honored to be um, you know on this on this uh, panel with. Uh, Lucy and Margaret and others as well. So I was asked to talk about um, uh, abandoning race-based PFT equations. You might have heard about this uh, in other uh, venues during the conference today. Um, I'm going to click here, I guess. Oops. Yeah. Let's try that. All right. So I have no uh, relationships to disclose. Uh, one other disclosure, there may be a small amount of math. Sometimes that makes people perspire or, or whatnot. Okay. So uh, just, uh, this is just a few of the sources that I used to help prepare this, and I just sort of wanted to point out this book by uh, Lundy Brown, Dr. Lundy Brown, called Breathing Race into the Machine. It's sort of a historical look at, at how spirometry has been used over the centuries uh, and some of the implications about using race. There's also a very cool website called pftforum.com, which has an amazing uh, a collection of history about uh, all manners of pulmonary function stuff uh, and uh, and actually current testing stuff for those of you that might be interested. And I'll talk a little bit more about these uh, workshop reports. And these are some of the uh, talented folks that contributed to this uh, workshop that I'll talk about in a minute. So first, why do we use reference equations? Well, one is to place a measurement from a patient in the context of what's uh, in the range from a healthy reference population. If you're talking about treating a patient with antibiotics or steroids or bronchodilators, that patient can serve as their own control. And in that case, you may not need a reference equation. But when you're looking over time, uh, or if you're looking uh, in, for example, children that are growing and their height is changing, then you really do need a reference equation to sort of uh, put that measurement in context. Um, we're not going to read through the slide. There's too much stuff on it. Uh, one of my colleagues actually sort of uh, suggested summarizing the history of PFT equations as the history of white men. And I think that there's some truth to that. Um, and I just want to highlight a couple things. Going back to the in 1800s, Hutchinson and, and Thackeray sort of subdivided subjects according to things like their um, occupation and social class and things like that. They recognized that some lung function, and the only one they talked about then was, was vital capacity, was at least related to height. Uh, race sort of came in during the U.S. Civil War in the 1860s, where Gould uh, had tables of vital capacity that was uh, uh, white soldiers, uh, free blacks, black slaves, and and had different tables for that and showed showed differences uh, that he attributed to race. 
Uh, women didn't come into the picture until the 1920s, um, uh, where uh, Ruth Boynton uh, showed that healthy women had lung function that seemed to be abnormal when using uh, uh, reference equations from men. A uh, whole bevy of equations came out in the 1970s and 80s. And another one that I just wanted to highlight was uh, in the 1970s that OSHA uh, discovered that, that blacks were disproportionately denied employment on the basis of pre-employment spirometry screening and required that a, a scaling factor was applied to white predicted values. That is what, what people would call race correction, which is n uh, not exactly what that we are doing in the modern era, uh, but but that was in fact just a, a multiplier factor added to a predicted value from white people. And then all sorts of other equations have, have come about. In 2012, uh, some very smart people, including uh, Philip Conjur uh, of Blessed Memory and Sonia Stanoyevic, uh, uh, came together with uh, the Global Lung Initiative, and they pulled together existing data uh, from uh, many parts of the world. So this was not prospectively collected, but retrospectively collected. Spirometry from 74,187 healthy non-smokers. Now, the vast majority of the subjects were white, uh, with smaller numbers of African Americans, North Asians, and Southeast Asians. And they published an equation uh, that used a more advanced statistical methodology uh, um, called GIMLSS. And uh, they had a smoothed equation that went all the way from age three to age 95. Prior to that, there were many equations that had, had discontinuities at age 18 or 20 or had multiple different equations. So this was a single equation that could be applied uh, for all ages, which was, was really nice. Subsequent to that, GLI has, has published equations for diffusing capacity uh, and lung volumes, and in progress are equations for multiple breath washout and pheno and exercise and hopefully a variety of other things. The idea behind thus uh, reference uh, equations, though, is that there's an, an, a range that may be normally distributed for most measurements, and that ideally you'd want to describe a population that is healthy. Uh, and what healthy is has been done very differently over time, and uh, I'm sure you couldn't read on that history slide, but some of those populations were just blood donors, and some of them were non-smoking uh, Mormons. And so it, it, how they defied healthy has really been different uh, in different uh, studies. They don't, they don't usually take into account uh, things like early life exposures to uh, respiratory viruses uh, or, um, you know, economic issues. So um, some of those things that we call social determinants of health are not included in these uh, population descriptions. But you can see that there's this range. And in GLI, one of the things that I think one of the advances was to describe, descri excuse me, start describing normal using standard deviation scores. So uh, we often describe it between the fifth and the 95th percentile or z-scores of negative 1.64 and plus 1.64 as the normal range. We recognized for many years that there are a variety of factors that affect predicted values that include uh, sex, uh, height, age, and one of the things that's been used uh, over the years has has been race and ethnicity, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But all these things have been thought to have uh, influence on uh, lung function. This is from the original July uh, 2012 paper uh, showing uh, uh, the trajectory of FEV1, and they described uh, four different populations, uh, white, um, African American, Northeast Asian, and Southeast Asian, and then they created a, a fifth group that was called other, which was really just a mathematical averaging of the other four groups. It wasn't actually subjects that that were left out of these four groups and then and categorized that way. It was just an averaging of these four groups, and you can see some differences uh, in the in the F, predicted FEV one for these different groups. So the question is, what explains those differences? And in some studies, uh, one explanation has been uh, differences in the proportion of total height represented by the upper body versus lower body. Sometimes that's called the Cormick index. And this is some data from Philip Conjure uh, showing that the Cormick index can vary by population somewhat. In another study from uh, from uh, some folks in London, they, they looked at... Um, uh, uh, children of Indian an ancestry and showed that depending on whether or not they were from an urban, uh, living in an urban condition or semi-urban or rural, that there were differences in lung function as well. So clearly there's um, um, things that may be uh, more environmental and things that may be perhaps influenced by the environment or influenced by genetics. Uh, Adjusting for sitting height uh, corrected about half of the difference between those uh, different uh, racial groups, but not all of it. So it's not clearly all about uh, sitting height. 
So this is uh, just sort of uh, to th throw out some of these terms that I've been using and try to define them a little bit. Race is usually ident an identity based on visible features like skin color, and it's really a social identity or sometimes a political identity. It's subjectively ascribed or assigned by self, but sometimes it may be assigned to a, a person by a hospital staff or police or others on the basis of physical characteristics. And I was really pleased to see a number of posters today with uh, centers around the country uh, asking people to, again, self-identify themselves and not have us identify them in EPIC or the medical record. Uh, ethnicity is really more of a cultural identity of people who are linked by a shared culture and language. And ancestry may get to family origin and genetic identity. So if I was asked to describe myself by these, by these different uh, categories, I would say my race is white, my ethnicity is Ashkenazi Jewish, and my ancestry is probably from a mixture of Hungary, Lithuania, and Latvia. And so those are different ways of describing myself. The degrees to which these these different things like race and ethnicity and ancestry overlap is really highly variable, and patients might have admixtures of ancestry as well. And one of the things that I think I took away from Lundy Brown's book, um, what I what I think was one of the most important takeaways that I took away is how would you how would you measure race? And I don't think that it's really possible to measure race. Many people don't fit into a single racial category, and and many people describe themselves as mixed race. And most of us are probably got some uh, mixture to us. And and so therefore, you know, if you could only measure height to the nearest meter, would we find that a useful thing to put into an equation? Probably not. And therefore, because we don't have any good way of utilizing race uh, in some sort of objective way, maybe we shouldn't be using that at all either. That's on top of the other reasons why we uh, don't want to use it, because it's been misused uh, uh, in many, many different uh, situations in a discriminatory way. So I wanted to throw out both this as a uh, what happens at sort of the individual level and then at the population level. So um, this is a 60-year-old uh, man. He's 187 centimeters tall. He's currently on... Uh, ETI, and he was interested in, in the Simplify study, which is now completed. But uh, let's just say he wanted to be in a study, and his mom uh, was white, his dad was black, and the con inclusion criteria for the study are having an FEV1 greater than 60%. So his measured uh, FEV1 was 2.13 liters, and if we used uh, predicted from GLI, uh, the race-specific ones, for an African-American, that would give him an FEV1 of 62% predicted. If we used white predicteds from GLI 2012, that would give them an FAV1 of 53% predicted. And if we use GLI Global from uh, the 2022 uh, uh, publication, that would give them an FAV1 of 55% predicted. So you can see that uh, how we would characterize that spirometry uh, w would be mild obstruction, mixed obstruction or restriction, or moderate obstruction, depending on which uh, equation we chose. And uh, so that 66-year-old man was Barack Obama. He doesn't actually have CF as far as I know. And that would affect his eligibility to be in this clinical trial. So he would be eligible if we used the GLI 2012 African-American predicteds and ineligible if we used a GLI white or global uh, predicteds. Let me give you one other example. So this is a 24-year-old woman, 71 inches tall. She's interested in a modulator study. I made up a name of a modulator study. And um, <laughs> they, they all sound like the same to me, right? And uh, so the inclusion criteria for this are an FV1 between 40 and 90, as are many of the studies. Her father identifies as black. Her mother's from Japan. She identifies herself as mixed race. So if we reuse predicted based on her father's identity, her FV1 is 41% predicted. If we use based on her mother's identity, it would be 36% predicted, and global would be 37% predicted. So again, she'd be eligible only if we chose the African-American equations and ineligible uh, based on the other equations. And again, the diagnostic impression of that spirometry might also change. And so this was um, Naomi Osaka. Osaka. So, um, you know, when patients come to our PFT lab, they might present with a variety of admixtures of racial identity, and we would be really challenged to know what do we type into the computer to properly uh, test them. And so all these people, in, including one of my favorite Steelers, uh, has, has mixed identity, and um, they have really fascinating stories to read about as I, as I pick their pictures out. What about what about lung transplant? So prior to 2021, FEV1 percent predicted was used in the lung allocation score, but only for a subset of lung transplant patients, only for patients in what was called Group D, which was not actually cystic fibrosis. Uh, as of September 2021, 
uh, spirometry measures were not part of the lung allocation score. And then as of March 2023, uh, they replaced the lung allocation score with something called the composite allocation score, which again doesn't use lung function measurements, maybe a little surprisingly to me. Um, so it doesn't really affect allocation of lungs, but it could, your choice of equation might affect who gets referred for transplant. Because if we have a threshold, an FEV1 below 30 or 40 or 50, whatever threshold you pick, that threshold may be affected by which equations you pick. So we need to be cognizant of that and not and not use bright lines for uh, deciding to make a referral. There's a couple of papers here I just wanted to mention. So one was um, um, this workshop report. So I, I showed you some of the pictures of the people that participated in this race and ethnicity and pulmonary function uh, test interpretation. So this is an official ATS statement that came out in um, uh, April of this year. And, and then uh, just before that uh, workshop report came out, uh, uh, Dr. Stanojevic's group uh, uh, and colleagues published this race-neutral approach to the interpretation of lung function measurements. So some people are calling this GLI 2022, some people are calling this GLI global, uh, call it whatever you like, but it's a single equation for all patients that doesn't require the inputting of a variable for race. And there's been now a, a few publications about what are the effects of switching to GLI global. This is one that was in uh, the Blue Journal in July. It was a very large uh, data set analysis from, I think, from Mayo Clinic, 109,000 tests, and they reanalyzed them with uh, GLI Global, which again is uh, um, sort of race neutral versus GLI 2020-12, which was the race specific. And they showed that the mean FEV1 FEC percent predicted increased in the white and Northeast Asian groups and decreased in the black Southeast Asian and mixed other groups. The prevalence of obstruction increased by about almost 10% in the white group, and that if possible, Restriction increased by 51 and 37 percent in the Black and Southeast Asian groups. Using GLI global in a population with equal representation of all five groups altered the interpretation of the spirometry about, in about 10 percent of the tests. And subjects who identified as Black were the only group with a relative increase in frequency of abnormal spirometry. Their frequency of spirometry increased abnormal spirometry increased by almost 33 percent. And so uh, down here, as you can sort of see on the bottom bottom here, what happened to FEV1% predicted for Northeast Asian sort of went up, uh, white people went up, black went down, uh, mixed went down a little bit, and Southeast Asian went down for both FEV1 and a relatively similar pattern for FEC. This is a study that was uh, from Dr. Stodoyevic's group published in JAMA uh, also this year, and this is using... Um, uh, the standard deviation scores of the z-scores, which uh, I sort of like, and showing you uh, at the top, um, this is FEV1 and the bottom FEC. The the change, this is the change in the z-score when switching to the race neutral. And you can see that for the white subjects shown here in this orange, that the average z-score went up, uh, maybe roughly a half of a z-score, and that for black patients, the average z-score went down by, again, roughly half of a z-score, but for some people, quite a bit more, for some people, a little bit less. And that was true for, for both FEV1 and FEC. Over on the right, these are called alluvial plots, which I never heard of before this paper, um, but they're kind of neat. So they sort of show you, if we took, um, for the white patients, um, this is how their spirometry would be interpreted, normal, um, restrictive, obstructive, and nonspecific, and then how the spirometry would be interpreted with a change to the equation to the GLI 2022 equations. And you, you can see that some patients that were had a nonspecific pattern would now be diagnosed with obstruction. Some people with a restrictive pattern would now be diagnosed as normal. These are for the white subjects. For black patients, and again, this is not CF, this is uh, all patients in their lab. You can see some of the patients that were normal uh, would now be interpreted as restrictive. And some people might be interpreted with a nonspecific pattern. And then there are these much smaller numbers of patients that have um, uh, uh, different shifts. Uh, so the I, I just sort of highlighted sort of the, the biggest ones. And I want to just mention, I, I don't think Dr. Rosenfeld is going to talk about it, but Dr. Rosenfeld has, a, has a, a paper that's been submitted looking at the CF patient registry, and some of that data was shared with the center directors this this morning uh, about what happens to the percent predicted. Then it's, it's, I would say it's an overall similar pattern. Lung function for white people will look a little bit better with the new equations. Lung function for black people will look a little bit worse with the new equations. And we have to both educate uh, physicians about how to use that educate our respiratory therapist, and importantly, educate our patients that nothing about them might have changed, but what the report looks like has changed. And, and that's going to be um, an important educational topic. Um, so I think this is a, 
I thought it was my last slide. Um, but I think uh, we often talk about the differences between equity and equality. And uh, so the reality is that we know that there are differences in lung function across populations. We don't really know all the things that explain those differences. Some of those things are social determinants of health. Some of them may be differences in biology. Equality would be um, uh, treating everyone uh, uh, with the same supports uh, or perhaps even in the same way. So maybe using GLI other equations for all patients or GLI global. Uh, I think the recommendation from the ATS workshop has been to use GLI global, but that's not going to be uh, immediate for all labs to be able to implement uh, really quickly necessarily. Uh, equity would be everyone's getting the support that they need, which um, produces equity, and that might be making sure that our data sets are really inclusive and having good representation from all populations. Uh, some people have proposed even using uh, ancestry-based kinds of equations. And then justice uh, would be really making sure that we have good outcomes for everybody and whatever equations we're using, making sure that people have good access to treatments, uh, testing, transplant, all the things that we worry about, that their outcomes are similarly good, which with regardless of the equations. So that's, I think, the end of my slides, and I'll be happy to take any questions. And the mic in the center of the room is live, and you can also ask questions on the app that we can relay to, to Daniel. Hey, Dr. Weiner, great talk. Uh, Sanjay Devarajan from Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I just wanted to find out, from a personal standpoint, have you implemented this change at your CF center already? What does that look like? And the other question I have is, you know, do you have to go to sort of the source prior to the spirometry being measured and adjust the racial classification to get the adjusted value? Or is there some way we can do this after it's been done? Is there some way to sort of correct for data that's already been yeah, sure. thank you for those questions. So our lab uh, uses, um, um, uh, so our, our software, uh, uh, we're waiting for sort of a software upgrade that will be ho hopefully happening in the next one or two months that will have the GLI Global built into it. Our, our current one does not. Um, uh, I think Dr. Rosenfeld has pointed out that uh, for the labs that are going to have trouble getting to GLI Global, using GLI Other as a pretty good approximation of that. Um, but so we are planning to implement GLI Global, my hope is within the next two to three months. When we do that, our entire database will be recomputed using the, the new equation so that on a given PFT report, uh, any two or three measurements can be compared using apples to apples. So that's happening for us. And the, C the CF uh, patient registry is going to be switching the smart reports to using GLI Global sometime in early 2024 as well. Um, this is from the uh, app, and this is from Jim Acton. Are there any studies comparing the predictive value of using sitting height instead of standing height? Um, so that that um, paper from London, I mean, it's not it's not an outcome, but it basically showed using sitting height corrected approximately fifty percent of the difference between white and black subjects in that study. Um, I think the problem will be. Uh, to sort of say, well, let's use sitting height instead of standing height, is the the 74,000 measurements in GLI don't have sitting height available for them. So you'd have to go and prospectively collect sitting height and spirometry. And I haven't found a lot of payers that are, are, are or funding agencies that are interested in paying to go collect normative data anymore. Um, so I, I, I think it's a great idea, but I don't know how we would um, operationalize it. So this question is from Melanie... Ben, I hope I'm getting that name right because I don't have my readers on. Um, and it is, how do you manage the difference in percentage when doing spirometry the first time after a change in the predicted values? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've heard from a few center directors where they've already gone ahead and implemented GLI Global, and, and some patients are um, appropriately getting a little bit uh, freaked out about the, the change in predicteds. Um, I think... Um, uh, we are working on some educational materials. I think the CF Foundation has a task force that's working on some educational materials, and GLI will work on some. I think it's really sort of uh, all about sort of explaining that uh, for adults, at least, you can look at their raw value and say, you know what, you're three liters today, you were three liters three months ago, and your percent of predicted has changed, but your three liters didn't change. Uh, that's slightly trickier for kids because they might have grown three centimeters in that in that time frame, but it's really, I think, about... Uh, trying to reassure people that this is a change in the way we're describing your lung function, but not a change in the way that your lung function actually is affecting you. 
And just as an add-on, would the change in lung function with um, the race corrected and the non-race included equations differ then? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Like the delta, if, there, if there's a difference in the change in using the two different forms of the equations. Yeah, there definitely is a difference. There definitely is a difference. So, okay. Yeah. Um, also, this is from Scott uh, Stofan. How does the global GLI equation differ from the GLI 2012 race other equation? Oh, um, uh, I don't think I can give a very uh, quantitative answer to that. I can say it's it's a relatively small difference. Um, the 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 way that the GLI global was was derived was taking all the data and modeling it together, whereas the GLI other was taking the four groups and taking the coefficients from those four groups and averaging them. So the GLI global both uh, did not average four separate equations. It had one equation, and it tried to also reweight the samples a little bit so that we didn't have 57,000 white and only 4,000 uh, black subjects. It tried to reweight them a little bit. Any other questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Araceli Biglow from uh, Corpus Christi, Texas at Driscoll Pediatrics. Um, my question is, is that it seems like you know we are all moving to this, but I don't see in, in the CF world, we're all you know going to be educated on it, but we're going to be using this for all pulmonology patients in our PFT labs. How do we educate the general public, our pediatricians, you know, other specialists that do refer to us, our rheumatologists, oncologists, and everything else? Yeah, th thank you. That's a really important point. Um, I think um, I'll, I'll say a couple things. So one is I think that there is some research starting to come out now about what are the impacts of GLI Global on non-CF patients in other ways. There are some studies about what are the impacts on decision-making for lung transplant surgery or thoracic, other thoracic surgery. Um, I think for sure there's going to be impacts on all sorts of other diseases where people use lung function testing. And I think we, we are going to have to educate those people in the same way that we're going to educate our patients. It's going to be trickier because I think CF families and patients are a little more savvy about lung function testing because they see it so often. So it's going to be a little bit more challenging. And I think that we also one of our one of our challenges is going to be to make sure that people understand that lung function testing comes with a degree of uncertainty to it, right? So that some of those bright lines that people might have used before need to be seen with a, a degree of fuzziness to them, and that we can't say, well, your FV1 is 51, so or, or 49 or whatever. That we we have to understand that there's some variability that's partly related to the equations that we've that we've chosen, and so that's going to be a task to do, I think. Sure. Um, this is from Amber Pajeska. It uh, says, our center has just updated equipment and is moving to GLI. Is there a race that is selected on the report, such as Caucasian? If so, how do you explain that to someone that's unaware? I don't know if that means the most recent GLI. Um, so I'm not sure. I think I might be able to interpret that question in a couple different ways. I'm not sure. I, I would think that if, if uh, it's supposed to be global. Yes, 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 yes. So I think um, uh, that may depend a little bit on how your software is formatting your reports, and you might want to talk to the people that, that control your PFT software and reporting to, to modify that a little bit. I think, you know, just like I would say our, our new software allows us to enter um, – uh, gender different than biological sex, and so we can put um, um, male for a for a, a trans male on our report, even though it may be using biological female to calculate the predictives. And so, how we display things uh, is also important to patients as well. I think we have to think about that when we design our reports. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very for that much. Appreciate. It. Any questions that we weren't able to answer right now, we'll answer on the app. Thank you. I just had a, uh, a quick comment. Um, Darlene Kauser from CHKD in Norfolk, Virginia. We re recently um, switched over, and as far as um, educating patients, what we've been doing in the CF clinic is we'll print out a trend report, and then we'll concentrate on the absolute value of the you know leaders, and that seems to be a um, little reassuring to them, and they can watch, see the graph and how they haven't dropped or whatever, so. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Margan Rosenfeld. 
She's a pediatric pulmonologist and a professor and associate vice chair for clinical research in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She's also the co-director for clinical and translational research at Seattle's Children's Research, research Institute. Her research focuses on multi-centered clinical trials and observational studies in children with CF with a special interest in early intervention strategies for CF lung disease and mobile health clinical trial endpoints. She has contributed extensively to the CF research and has presented at numerous NACFCs. Please join me in inviting Dr. Rosenfeld up to the stage. Well, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me here and to this engaged audience. And also, I'd also like to give an incredible shout out to Dr. Weiner. That's a really tough topic. And I look forward to some robust discussion in the last 15 minutes. Let's see. Uh, I don't, maybe I can advance them this way. You should be able to use it now. Yep. Yeah. OK, great. Is that the, just want to make sure. Yeah, OK, now that I've got my clicker all working. So everyone in this room is very well aware that during the pandemic, all of our CF centers rapidly pivoted to remote spirometry for clinical care. And I'm sure all of you are scrambling to deal with the Zephyrax and Mir Spiral Bank app and software, respectively, that was provided so graciously by the CF Foundation to all of our patients. And so you're very well aware of the level of training of um, not only respiratory therapists, but particularly of people with CF to perform home spirometry correctly. Um, uh, FEV1, traditionally measured by office spirometry, is a really key clinical trial endpoint. Um, and so as we've pivoted towards uh, remote or hybrid uh, clinical trial design, the accuracy and the feasibility of spirometry in the research setting is unknown. So we don't know whether FEV1 measured at home is really going to fly as a clinical trial endpoint. So I work a lot in the field of remote clinical trials or, or consideration of remote clinical trials and trying to figure out what we need to understand to see if these are feasible. So the shift to home monitoring during the, during the pandemic uh, really uh, was sort of a silver lining in terms of opening up possibilities for remote conduct of clinical trials, bringing the trial to the patient. And I think we're all aware that um, remote or, or hybrid clinical trials have the potential to really improve the partic participant experience um, by reducing the burden associated to, with travel, risk of uh, infections in the in-person setting, uh, and potentially recruiting people who couldn't before participate in clinical research to enroll in clinical trials. So home spirometry holds significant promise as a clinical trial endpoint, but we really don't know enough yet about um, whether it will um, be accurate enough and feasible enough to work out. Uh, with home measurements, we could potentially do more frequent measurements. Um, that give a more granular picture or a more targeted picture of uh, FEV1 over time. We, of course, get a real-world picture, um, and uh, people wouldn't necessarily need to travel for in-person visits. And then there's infection control concerns, both for people with CF th themselves and as an aerosol-generating procedure in the lab or hospital. Um, home spirometry also holds great promise for clinical care. My area of research is uh, for home spirometry as a research endpoint, but I'm going to talk on the work of some colleagues of mine in the um, QI space for clinical care as well. And um, I'm sure there will be a lot of discussion about the use of it in clinical care. Um, so uh, use of ho home spirometry for uh, clinical care is important for a number of reasons. It's a could be a really great tool to empower people with CF to be able to better monitor their own health in their own way on their own schedule. Um, I think it holds promise for early detection of exacerbations, though a couple of studies have shown that early detection doesn't necessarily need, lead to better outcomes, but that's a still relatively untested area. Um, it can be used to monitor response to starting treatments, but also to stopping treatments in this era of simplification of chronic treatment burdensome regimens, and of course can be used with telehealth visits. 
So home spirometers are definitely out there. Um, this is uh, a slide showing um, the um, influence of the home spirometers that were shipped by the CF Foundation to, by 2021, over 70% of uh, our CF patients. And I'm not sure how many of them are in shoe boxes in the back of closets <laughs> and forgotten how to use them, but they're definitely out there. So we have to be really, really careful to get home spirometry right. If we get it right, it can be an accurate and reliable measurement that can improve access to clinical trials and decrease participant burden in these trials and improve the experience of our participants in our clinical trials. But we really can't get it wrong. If we get it wrong, um, first of all, we'll have the garbage in, garbage out ph phenomenon where um, it's just not accurate enough to detect any sort of treatment effect. Um, it could definitely worsen inequities. We have to take into account the digital divide um, and it could really uh, paradoxically increase coordinator and patient burden. And uh, for any of you have, who have been engaged in home spirometry, I'm sure that really resonates with you. So I think we need to go into this with a lot of equipoise and a lot of humility. And all of you RTs in the audience are critical to getting it right. You are the rock stars. You are the ones who know how to do spirometry both in the office and at home. Uh, and we need to engage and learn from you to make sure that we get it right. So. What do we know so far about home spirometry? Um, first of all, I'm going to give you the punchline before I give you the data, so that if you fall asleep in the next few seconds, you still have gotten this. Um, home spirometry tends to underestimate FEV1 measured in the office, not in all patients and not at all times, but on average, the same patient will blow a lower home FEV1 than an office FEV1. Probably not a surprise. Home spirometry is more variable than office spirometry. Um, remote coaching, so video coaching, or it used to be phone coaching, but now we can mostly do video coaching, definitely on average produces better results than uncoached me measurements. And then, uh, not very surprising either, young children, particularly those ages 6 to 11, have more difficulties in performing home spirometry than older children and adults, and coaching helps them more. So I'm going to give you a few results from um, an analysis that I did of home spirometry in our PROMISE study, and my apologies if any of you yesterday were at my talk because there's two overlapping slides, but um, I thought it would be helpful to place this in context. So uh, for those of you who, there's all these acronyms, it's hard to keep all these studies straight, so I'll just remind you that the PROMISE Center study is an ongoing North American multi-center longitudinal observational study that's looking at the clinical effectiveness of ETI or TRICAFTA. And we have two co cohorts, children who are 6 to 11 years of age and teens and adults, so those over 12 years of age. And as part of the study assessments, there's home spirometry done at enrollment, three months, six months, 12 months, and then in an ongoing basis as we have an extension to the study now. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we added very rapidly home spirometry as a study procedure. Um, because we, of course, couldn't bring people in person to do this aerosol generating procedure. And that afforded us the opportunity to compare home and office measurements. So um, this is the first slide and it's sort of complicated, so let me orient you to it. So on the top panel, we have coached results and on the bottom panel, we have uncoached results. And then, um, oh, well, that was sort of weird. Okay, <laughs> it says it on both sides. And then um, on the uh, the 12, ages 6 to 11 are on the lowest row within coached or uncoached, then 12 to 18, then 16, then 18 to 30, and then above 30. And this is from our, our modeling, the estimated difference between home and office spirometry. And you can see that uh, a difference of zero is far over to the right, and then the farther over to the left that you go, the more home FEV1 underestimates office FEV1. And you can see a couple of important things. The first one is that um, in those 30 and above, there really isn't too much difference be between home and office spirometry, but there's a pretty big difference between home and office spirometry, particularly in the 6 to 11 year old. So the younger you are, the more difference there is. Um, the second thing you can see this is that the difference is less in the coached group than the uncoached group. Uh, and that this difference between coached and uncoached is biggest in the younger kids. 
We also looked at the effect of FEV1. We're using Z-scores here, and Daniel, thank you very much for um, just reminding folks what a Z-score is. Um, and so we have um, the difference between home and office spirometry by age group, uh, by coached and uncoached. So blue is the um, uncoached and pink or red or salmon or whatever that is. I guess since I'm from Seattle, I'll say salmon um, is the is the coached. And then we have the effect of z-scores. So the higher z-scores are to the right and the lower z-scores are to the left. And what you can see is that in the groups 12 to 18, 18 to 30, and above 30, um, the, there definitely is an effect of, um, of lung function. So the higher your FEV1 is, the more underestimated the home spirometry is relative to office spirometry. And coaching makes a difference, but not a huge difference. Then if you look at the 6 to 11-year-olds, you see that this is just highly exaggerated. So there's a, the, the, and of course, these younger kids are much more likely to have the high FEV1 Z-scores. They all have normal lung function on Trikafta these days. So you can see that um, in, with the higher Z-scores, the FEV1 is really a lot lower by home than by office spirometry. Um, and that coaching helps more than in the other groups. So the title of this uh, talk had been about out outreach, and maybe I jumped the gun a little bit because we don't yet have results to present, so mainly I can whet your appetite. So outreach is an ongoing, prospective, longitudinal, multi-center, observational study that's comparing home to office spirometry in children and adults with CF in the research setting. You know, there have been a fair number of publications now that look at like a single center uh, experience in the clinical world with home spirometry, but we're looking at it really prospectively and rigorously in the research setting. And we aim to address some key unanswered questions that can help us decide if we can move this forward as a clinical trial endpoint. So the first question we're asking is, is home spirometry accurate? Then how variable is it? We, we know it's more variable than um, office spirometry, but we want to characterize that. Does the coaching that's done virtually improve measurement quality? Uh, what is the adherence to these weekly home measurements? And then what is the feasibility and acceptability in terms of qualitative interviews of uh, research coordinators and participants? And so um, this time next year, hopefully, we'll have a publication. The last patient last visit is going to be in December, and we're hoping to be able to actually look at the data in late December. I guess it will be my Hanukkah present, so there you go. Um, I wanted to focus a little bit on some really fun um, work that we did to, to develop the study very closely with people with CF and research coordinators. And I have to say, that was just such an enriching experience for the whole study team, but I'll just speak for myself, for me. So um, as we were thinking about the study design, we did some focus groups with people with CF and with research coordinators and learned a lot from them about barriers and facilitators of home spirometry and then incorporated as many of their recommendations as we could into the study design, hopefully making it a better study. And then um, we co-produced all of the study materials with just a rock star group of people with CF, uh, research coordinators, and a respiratory therapist as well. Um, and then um, we really um, have worked hard to um, use these materials uh, in training of both our participants. So of course, they're very sophisticated in terms of office spirometry and our, our research coordinators. We also incorporated, and this was on the recommendation of our focus groups, a run-in kind of training period to maximize the quality of home spirometry. And then we have um, humans, actually, we're not all AIs yet, who are um, overreading and grading all of the loops and then providing feedback to our participants and even some video coaching about what they're not getting quite right during that run-in training period. Um, and then we also have a wraparound um, uh, uh, mixed methods kind of qualitative evaluation of the research coordinator and participant experience, which we hope will then inform the design of future clinical trials. We're really worried about this being too burdensome um, you know, you think, oh, home spirometry, great, that should be really lightweight, but it, it isn't. It's much more complicated than that. So we want to learn about what the real life experience has been. So in these focus groups, people with CF told us that most of them found home spirometry convenient, but they definitely experienced technical barriers, surprise, surprise, reported a learning curve about these home measurements, and were just unclear about how accurate they were and what, how to really interpret them. Research coordinators told us that the major barriers that they identified were um, tailoring the participant training to the individual needs, whether that be based on age or experience or other factors, 
scheduling the remote coaching, right? It's so hard to get people to uh, actually call back if you try to text them or call them or email them to set up the remote coaching. And then making sure that they really felt comfortable performing that uh, remote coaching effectively. So um, uh, Greg Sawicki, who's one of my co-investigators on the outreach study, uh, has a some preliminary results from the baseline survey of the research coordinators, which is poster 118, so you can go and get some free swag and, and swing by that poster in the expo room. Um, so as I said, we incorporated as many of these recommendations as we could into the design of the study, and I, I think hopefully it made it a better study. Um, then the next thing that we did was uh, co-produce uh, an, all of our uh, research coordinator and patient face, participant facing materials with a great team. And um, what that meant was that we, um, it was a kind of an interdependent, interdependent collaboration between the um, investigate, some of us who are investigators, and then the end users, which in this case is the research coordinators and the, um, and the participants. And it was um, really uh, ensuring that we all felt like we had our voices heard. Uh, and um, we're able to produce, I think, something where the sum, wait, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And it was good fun, and it was a lot of work. So as I said, we had people with CF, including a caregiver, or actually parent, a mom of a child with CF, and some adults with CF, members of our research team, and then research coordinators, including one respiratory therapist who was unbelievably both helpful and tech savvy. So um, we co-produced the consent form, um, user guides both for participants and for research coordinators in the form of uh, some handouts um, and um, uh, some longer things as well. And then we also uh, co-produced several videos and I'm going to give you the link. My goal is to get these out there f uh, as much as we can for uh, dissemination. And so let me see if I can get this to work. This is uh, just a brief clip of one of our videos. We made three. This video demonstrates how to help a young child perform home spirometry using the Mir SpiroBank Smart Spirometer and the ZephyrX Breathe Easy app. This video assumes that you've already paired your spirometer with the Breathe Easy app. After the spirometer has paired with the Breathe Easy app, click on Breathing Tests. Then click on FVC, Forced Vital Capacity. You're going to coach your child to do their best effort. Once the child is ready, you'll ask them to put on nose clips. Remind them to stand or sit with good posture. Click continue when they're ready to take a deep breath in and follow the prompts on the screen. Ask them to put their lips around the mouthpiece. With their lips sealed around the mouthpiece, prompt them to take a deep breath in all the way until they can't breathe in any more air. Then coach them to blast out the air in their lungs as hard and fast as they can until they can't breathe out any more air. You can tell them to pretend like they're blowing out lots of birthday candles. Okay, so I think you get the idea. That's my little patient, uh, Cyrus. And at one clinic visit, I asked him what he wanted to be when he got older, and he said, an astronaut, no, an actor, no, an actor astronaut. So I knew he was one of the right people to ask. <laughs> And um, uh, it was really uh, great fun making those videos and also just a chance, to, we had a lot of downtime to get, all get to know each other better. Uh, and he got, I don't know what you call it, I've not never done anything acting, but you know, when you go one, two, three, boom, and you close that thing to, he was very excited to get to do that a whole bunch of times. We had lots of takes. Um, then I just took screenshots of some of the other uh, materials that we developed, but again, um, I have the URLs for the videos because they're on the NACF, or sorry, the CFF website as YouTube videos, but please, 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 please email me if you want any of the other materials. I couldn't quite figure out how to just uh, like like put in a link to them because they're, uh, they're just uh, hard copy things. So we did some different handouts um, as well. And here's the link to the videos. And again, um, if you go on CFF, you can website, you can find them too. So we made three of them: how to perform home spirometry for everyone, how to do remote coaching uh, if you're a patient, and then how to coach your child with. And that's the one that you saw there. 
Okay, and then I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about home spirometry in the clinical care setting. And um, this, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a collaborator, a consultant on the iSpy study, but I am not a QI person. I don't understand any QI terms. I know it works really well. So um, I'm, this, these are slides that were graciously given to me by two of my colleagues and friends who are doing ongoing QI projects in the home spirometry okay. space. So the first one is iSpy which is led by my colleague and friend, Theda Ong, um, and it stands for Innovations for Home Spirometry Implementation in Youth with Cystic Fibrosis. And there are collaborators uh, here, Corey Danes at, uh, sorry, in Tucson uh, at Banner, and then Vanderbilt uh, and Boston Children's Hospital as well. And the global aim of the iSpy project is to, to develop a core set of practices that provide home, spirom home spirometry services that are feasible and meet the needs of our families and our clinics. So they're, they are working now to adapt the outreach training materials and processes to the clinical care setting with input from the uh, clinic staff uh, as well as uh, patients and families. Um, and then they're gonna test and refine using QI methods to um, develop the best interventions uh, that produce measurements of acceptable quality. And then they're also um, working with the same collaborator that I did with for our focus groups, caregiver and clinical perceptions for what helps or hinders home spirometry. And so um, they're do beginning with asking, kind of understanding the staff training and awareness of family situations that might make it easier or harder to do home spirometry. Um, and then they're going through these outreach uh, materials and modifying them as necessary, adapting them. Uh, and then um, they're uh, doing a lot of uh, work on coaching, uh, both for setup, but also for the measurements themselves. Uh, and then a lot of work around how to interpret the results with families, uh, and then how to, how to keep up the work, good work over the long haul. And then the second is um, the implementing clinical use of pediatric home spirometry. There's a familiar face there, I think. In fact, I think that's the same picture. Look at that, um, <laughs> along with uh, Dr. Clement Wren and Dr. D.B. Sanders. Uh, so the ICUP study is is got um, distinct aims. It's The global aim is to increase and improve the use of home spirometry in children with CF. But there's more of an emphasis on integrating home spirometry results into existing data flow and into the clinical workflow, which are obviously absolutely critical. So these are very complementary studies. And um, here are um, some of the early successes, challenges, and lessons learned. So there's a lot of enthusiasm from patients, families, and the care team in terms of doing um, home spirometry, and they were able to find a lot more folks, people with CF interested in home spirometry than those who just got the Zephyrex during the pandemic. But it's been hard to sign people up on the dashboard. It's been hard for people to go home and find their old home spirometers. Um, and then um, they're thinking about how to um, translate their current model of home spirometry to a larger number of CF centers uh, and how to be careful to minimize selection bias in those who are getting a home spirometer. Um, and then I think all of us in this field would agree that if you can set up the device in clinic, that works a lot, be lot better than trying to do it at home. So in conclusions, Respiratory therapists are absolutely critical to the success of home spirometry. You are the ones who can do the best training, monitoring of results, uh, helping participants interpret results or patients, and remote coaching. There are great training materials available, I'm sure from a lot of different areas, so we should really create a repository of them and share them. And we still have lots to learn and we can learn from each other, so let's share our experiences. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the Outreach uh, TDN Coordinating Center study team, our co-production team, my uh, qualitative um, uh, research gurus at the University of Washington, uh, my outreach co-investigators, uh, Drs. Ariel Berlinski and Greg Sawicki, uh, the outreach research coordinators, participants and their families, and then those uh, my colleagues who pl provided the QI slides as well. And I think I'm, we're all probably ready for questions and answers. I, 
Thanks for your talk, Margaret. Um, I'm not sure you can learn from our own experience, but I thought I'd just share it in case you could perhaps advise. But um, we developed a, a home spirometry program at my centre in Melbourne, the Royal Children's Hospital Melbourne, a few, few years before the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, uh, we were actually ready to go with everyone with home spirometers. And the system that we had was it's, it's actually run by our respiratory therapists and uh, the spirometers are all calibrated before being issued out to the families. The families and the children love them. It's a pediatric center. Um, the results are all integrated into our electronic medical record. And we sort of think the system is beautifully set up. So that's the good news. The problem is when we looked at our clinic data uh, during the pandemic, we found that our median FEV1 had fallen by 7% during the pandemic from this remote spirometry. So we're sort of wondering what to do next because we've got the system set up as beautifully as we think we can do in terms of what we perceive to be the quality control. Um, but the results uh, show that we're still underestimating FEV1. Yeah, well, first of all, I guess I'm not surprised how far ahead of the curve you are. That's really impressive. I feel a conspiracy theory coming on, but I won't say anything about that. <laughs> Um, and I, I think you're, you know, we can really learn from you. There's no simple answer, obviously, but I, I would give a couple of them. I'm sure you've thought of, oh, first of all, I think the coach measurements are definitely going to be the more uh, reliable measurements. It's also a little bit kind of like what uh, Daniel was just describing, you're, that the there may be like a, a constant delta between the home and the office spirometry. And so if it is constant over time, then change over time may be just as reliable with the home than the office spirometry. And you just kind of have to reestablish the, the, um, the Y intercept. Um, and actually the primary endpoint in the outreach study is the, cha the three month change in FEV1 comparing home to office, because that's what we really all care about. That was, that was a really good uh, lead into the question I was going to ask. Is um, I think that at least in the U.S., um, the choice of spirometers was sort of made for us by the CF Foundation, right? So everyone has the Mir One uh, spirometers. I don't know how generalizable is that to a Nouveau Air or, or other. I'm not sure what you're using in Melbourne. Yeah, it's, it's not your. And it's not. It's not <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 how generalizable are these results? If, if, um, you know, I, for better or for worse, I guess most of the CF patients have this one, so that's what we may as well study, I guess. But is it generalizable? Do you think? That, that is such a critical question. So, we did a little internal study comparing the Nuvo Air and the Zephyr X. Actually, just. Uh, all of us who were like <laughs> on the the staff or the investigators doing the study, and we decided to go with Zephyrex. So it was a pretty soft call. Certainly, we would nothing never like publish or hang our hats on. But I think there are two questions. One is, you know, is there is there a difference right now? But what about in five or ten years? Right, this whole field is evolving so rapidly. So probably not all that generalizable. I think that this is the worst case scenario because I think technologies will only approve, improve, but we may be able to make some um, conclusions or that, that will help inform how to move things ahead in the future. Michael Schechter, Shalom Sasso, Richmond. Um, so this doesn't necessarily help from the standpoint of research, but as a clinician, when we're using uh, the home spirometry, we're, we're sort of using it conditionally. And basically, if somebody is doing it at home and they're giving us FEV1s that are about what we were getting in the clinic, we accept them as being right. Whereas if they're down, then we have our doubts about it. And before we act on that, we'll typically then bring them in to confirm. So my question to you is whether you had any signal in, um, in what you were looking at, whether there were any uh, FEV1 measurements that seemed to overestimate what you were getting in clinic. Yeah. Um, so if, let me see. So in the six to eleven year olds with the lower FEV one Z scores, there were quite a few actually that overestimated. Okay. So my our conditional approach is not necessarily going to be that good. Well, I would push back on that, Mike, Michael. So I think um, the six to eleven year olds are really sort of the pro problem age range, and above that, I think that you're it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So um, what, what would you recommend as the way to get results from home spirometry um, into the medical record 
to indicate how they're using. So for those of us that are using ZephyrX and have the dashboard where we can pr print PDFs of our results, um, we can scan those into the medical record, but that may not even be available for some, for some centers or sustainable for those of us that are using it right now. Um, so if we're gonna use these for clinical decision-making, what do you think the best way to get that information into the medical record, um, assign it to a doctor for interpretation and, and get a result from it is? Yeah, I think that's such a great question, and I, I just am not quite sure what, that we're there yet. You know, obviously, uh, some a group like Zephyrx or Nuvo Air would have to work on database integration, say, with Epic, um, and that probably will be forthcoming. I think another piece of it is deciding how much the care team really wants to see all those measurements. So that's that's going to be a little bit more of a um, uh, individual uh, site decision. Yeah, we'll take this last question. Thanks for a great talk, Margaret. Um, at the Hospital of Breakfast and Children in Toronto, we were sort of developing a very fledgling home spirometry program. Um, we sort of acknowledged that we weren't going to see the same values of FEV1 at home as we were in the lab. So we sort of um, embarked on trying to compare home values to home values. Um, so when patients were sent home with their spirometer, they were asked to do it daily consecutively for 10 days. We mapped and tracked the results to establish the mean for that patient on their mm. spirometer. And so then any, any subsequent measurements at clinically opportune times, that was the comparator. And I'm just interested in your thoughts on that approach. Yeah, well, leave it to you guys to have an innovative and really great approach. That makes so, so much sense. Um, uh, I think I think it's a great idea. I think there you know there is a learning curve with home spirometry, and I think that rigorous training you know not like they have to get a PhD in home spirometry, but some real training and then some coaching I think helps. So maybe getting patients to a, a stable place and then doing that kind of measurement. Maybe it doesn't have to be daily, but establishing the home spirometry baseline. I think we're all getting at the point that maybe. Home spirometry is its own biomarker, and office spirometry is its own biomarker, and uh, people should be able to do their best job at home spirometry and then follow that over time. Thank you, Dr. Rosenfeld, for an amazing presentation. So our next speaker is uh, Robert Jim Norton. He's he's a Robert Jim, like I'm a James Andrew. Um, he has a master's in respiratory therapy and is a registered respiratory therapist and a registered pulmonary function technician. He works for the Children's Hospital of Richmond. Um, not only is he a, not only does he do pulmonary function testing, but he's been the senior CF respiratory therapist for 32 years. Um, he learned to be a respiratory therapist in the U.S. Army and he has spent 37 years in the Virginia Commonwealth University Health System. So welcome, Jim Norton. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, boy, this is some hard stuff to follow up. Uh, but uh, uh, first, I want to say I appreciate all of my team members that are in here trying to find a place for standing up. Uh, and uh, and I also appreciate my colleague down the road about two hours, um, Darlene, uh, and her comments already. So uh, I don't have any disclosures, and I would like to um, try to talk to you about uh, using ATS uh, ERS guidelines to improve clinical spirometry data, and based on the two talks that we've already um, have been exposed to, um, it becomes even more important for us to get it right. Uh, so uh, a little bit of background, uh, spirometry is the most commonly performed pulmonary function test. Uh, it's widely used in the assessment of lung function to provide objective information that we use in the diagnosis of lung diseases and monitoring lung health. In 2005, the, the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society jointly adopted technical s standards for conducting spirometry. Then in 2019, uh, with improvements in instrumentation and computational capabilities, new research studies and enhanced quality assurance approaches, technical standards for spirometry were updated to take full advantage of current technical capabilities. Uh, so um, to um, 
contrast the differences in, in the two standards, uh, the 2019 ATS ER standards focus more on the acceptability of individual measurements of the FEV1 and FEC rather than on the maneuver as a whole uh, in the 2005 standards. The new objective method uh, determines which FEV1 and FEC measurements are considered acceptable uh, versus those uh, technically unacceptable measurements which can still be considered clinically useful or the term uh, it being used is usable. Uh, a spirometer review, uh, spirometer re measures the maximal volume of air that an individual can inspire and expire with maximal effort. The primary signal being that um, <clears throat> that is measured in, uh, is either uh, volume or flow as a function of time. The most relevant measures discussed in the document are the FEC, force vital capacity, made as forcefully and completely as possible starting from full inspiration, our total lung capacity. The FEV1 is the expiratory vo uh, volume in the first second of the FEC maneuver. Uh, again, based on the, the discussions that uh, we've already um, been uh, uh, listening to, uh, there's a great deal of importance of performing spirometry that meets ATS, ERS criteria and CF care. It's essential for uh, pulmonary exacerbation diagnosis and treatment and is a necessary component of all clinical encounters for patients who are developmentally capable of doing it. Uh, Busick uh, et al. Uh, in 2022 stated that FEV1 is associated with increased likelihood that cough and sputum are diagnosed as a pulmonary exacerbation. Uh, Aquino um, et al. 2022 uh, stated that routine spirometry is associated with higher rates of diagnosis and treatment of pulmonary exacerbations, possibly impacting long-term pulmonary function. Uh, I think a lot of us are used to seeing um, this particular piece of information. This is a print screen from a CF uh, smart report. Um, and um, so, uh, let's see here, just a moment. I just want to try to get this. There we go. Okay. Uh, sorry, got to move. So, um, up here in the upper right hand corner is the lung function status. Uh, blue is the FEC percent predicted, and red is FEV1 percent predicted. On the lower left hand corner, then we have the current. Uh, I'm sorry I chopped it off there, but it's the FEV, FEV1 and FEC percent predicted. Um, this represents the current data uh, or the most current data that is uh, reported in, in this particular uh, report as well as the raw data. Okay. Uh, so to begin with, we really need to make sure that we um, standard or stabilize or uh, the the testing environment uh, we need to account for the current ambient uh, room temperature barometric pressure and time of day uh, should be utilized to calibrate the spirometry instrument of these the temperature is the most important variable in most pulmonary function testing uh, there are some uh, spirometry uh, devices that i'm sorry that was supposed to be devices that can measure temperature directly and spirometers that require barometric pressure measurement should have a barometric pressure sensor with the ability to calculate the mean barometric pressure using altitude above sea level. <clears throat> patient details, a uh, huge issue in our clinic. Um, the patient's age, height, and weight, wearing indoor clothes and without shoes are recorded. Height in centimeters should be uh, in uh, one decimal place uh, and weight to the nearest 0.5 kilograms should be recorded. The, the height should be obtained without the shoes. The feet should be together with the patient standing as tall as possible with their eyes looking level and straight ahead with their back flush against the wall or stadiometer. Uh, patient demographics or patient details, birth and s birth sex and ethnicity should be included in the patient information on the spirometer request. When requesting birth date sex data, patients should be given the opportunity to provide their gender identity as well. Patients should be informed that although their gender identity is respected, it is the birth sex and not the gender that is the determinant of the predicted lung size. An accurate entry of uh, the birth sex may lead to an incorrect diagnosis and treatment. Uh, patients should also be informed of the need for reporting uh, ethnicity. 
And optimizing the FEV1 and FEC maneuver, a patient should assume the correct upright posture. They should not be leaning forward. Uh, they should not be pointing their head into the, into the ceiling. Um, you want to, if possible, you want to use nose clips. Young children, not too crazy about them. You place the mouthpiece in their mouth between their teeth, over their tongue, close their lips around the mouthpiece. Uh, instruct the patient to breathe normally. You should have the patient inspire completely and rapidly with a pause of less than or equal to two seconds uh, at, at TLC, total lung capacity. Uh, the patient should expire with maximal effort until no more air can be expelled while maintaining an upright posture, and then have them in, inspire with maximal effort until completely full. Uh, you should repeat testing as necessary, coaching as vigorously as possible. Repeat for a minimum of three maneuvers, and I say that's a, a minimum. Uh, people in pediatric labs know that that's not realistic. Uh, usually no more than eight for adults, um, and I don't have many adults that would ever make it that far. So, um, so and along the line, you're going to be checking for FEV1 and FC repeatability and, and performing more maneuvers as necessary or, or as tolerated. And I'm going to talk to, about that in just a little more detail. Um, for the expiration only devices, which the, the um, Zephyr is a little bit wonky about that, but um, you're still going to attach the nose clips if possible. And you're going to have them in separate of the device. You'll have them inspiring completely and rapidly with a pause of less than two seconds at TLC. Then they'll put their mouth uh, piece in their mouth and close the lips around the mouthpiece and follow those instructions uh, as in closed circuit spirometry technique. Um, another one of the uh, differences between 2005 to 2019 ATS ERS standards over that uh, is that of the term end of test, uh, which used to be abbreviated as EOT. Um, we are now moving to the term in 2019 to the uh, e -E -F -E -O -F -E, or end of force expiration. And so, uh, as in the 2005 standard, stress the importance of maximal inspiration after the force expiration. So, uh, and what that resulted in was the end of force expiration was really not the end of the maneuver in some patients. So that's why we are going to, that's why we're transitioning to the term EOFE. And recognizing a satisfactory EOFE is important to ensure that a true FEC has been achieved. These are the standards, and it's really the top three. I'm sorry I added four, but that was an, it's an important term I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, but the number one um, criteria is that there needs to be a, a less than a 0 0.025 liter change in volume for at least one second. It's considered the most reliable indicator of complete expiration. Uh, the system's going to need to provide both an indicator on the real-time display and an audio alert, such as a single beep. Um, not all systems, really, not all softwares work exactly the same. The patient has achieved an FET of 15 seconds. Uh, since I'm not doing adults, I don't see them trying to do that anymore. Uh, the patient cannot expire long enough to achieve a plateau, e.g. children with high elastic recoil or patients with restrictive lung disease. Uh, I just want to uh, emphasize uh, that um, closure of the glottis uh, may pre prematurely terminate a maneuver and render the effort un unacceptable for FEC, even with the apparent duration of expiration being much longer. And that's uh, particularly an issue in children um, that I uh, combat on a regular basis. Um, so in the interest of time, and I'm, I'm going to use Dr. Weiner's um, uh, uh, excuse that uh, this is pretty busy uh, but it is straight from the uh, standardization of 2019 update and i recommend this as being one of your regular tools of determining uh, the acceptability usability and repeatability criteria for fe1 and fec uh, the all of the acceptability and usability criteria criteria and are on the left uh, and the um, requirements for acceptability are pretty tight um, and um, you should not have, in particular, draw to attention that there should be no cough in the first second of expiration. There should be no glottic closure after one second of expiration. And they need to achieve one of the three EOFE tech indicators that I've previously discussed with you. Uh, 
in the F so for uh, usability um, notice that there's quite a bit more flexibility there and they don't have to meet as many uh, of, of these standards as they do for acceptability and so that's you know if we can make something out of it to use it for uh, for clinical utility all right let's see here Sorry, I'm trying to guide the okay so um, when it comes to um, assessing uh, maneuver acceptability and repeatability uh, FE, both FEC and FEV values um, there's a there's a uh, divider between greater than six and less than six years of age uh, greater than six the FEC and the FEV1 should be less than or equal to uh, 0 0.150 liters or 150 milliliters and for less than six, the difference should be, uh, for the FEC and FEV1, should be less than or equal to 0.100 liters uh, or milliliters and or 10% or of the highest value. Um, that also, this is directly taken from the 2019 standardization document. And um, this oops, looks like I've already talked about that. Sorry. Forgot to move those. Around. Okay. Um, looks like I'm, okay. So the next tool is um, the uh, <clears throat> that's in the 2019 standardization document uh, is a grading system for the spirometry test, and that is also based on the. Um, the information that I previously gave you. And this is also um, a, a very valuable um, document to have um, close by to your testing station. So uh, you can uh, get a bit, little bit more specific information about what constitutes uh, repeatability in children greater than six years, or patients greater than six years of age, and repeatability uh, less than six years of age. Mm, nope. All right. Click on 21 there. Hmm? Just Where? click on 21 up in your oh. right that side. Should Thank you. Um, and so we've already had a pretty significant. Um, to, to move it along, you can use it. Hmm? To move it along, you can just use these arrows. It's not. Yeah, I'm in the. Or you can use the clicker. Yeah. So. Um, We've already had a discussion about the um, which reports, uh, which global, which reference sets should be used, um, and we've established that um, the CF Smart reports are still using Global Lung Initiative 202012. So it was good to hear Dr. Weiner's um, information that um, that there's going to be a transition um, to the to the global um, the use of the global. Um, uh, Global Lung Initiative uh, normatives. And it was also nice that uh, Dr. Warner also uh, spent a lot of time uh, talking to us about um, using uh, Z-scores and uh, uh, normal distribution, um, statistical normal distribution concepts in the 2019 uh, <coughs> uh, criteria. Uh, uh, testing criteria, uh, standards. Um, we, we know that right now it still facilitates standardized reporting and interpretation of pulmonary function measurements. Uh, GLI equations include the largest samples of healthy individuals and represents a single standard to compare observed measurements applicable across all ages and calculate z-scores, which describe how many standard deviations a measured value differs from the predicted value. Uh, briefly going to discuss the uh, different uh, types of flow volume loops that you would see during your testing, um, and A being uh, normal, uh, B being representing mild to moderate obstruction, C represents severe obstruction, uh, D is variable extrathoracic obstruction. And what I want to point out here, um, which I would have taken a little bit more time, is that notice that there is a lot of uh, flow signal linearity in, in all of these particular graphs here. And regardless of, of how um, normal or unnormal they are, I 
I'm sorry, folks. Which one? The forward arrow. Right here, bud. Here. Oh. All right. There you go. Um, this is another set of um, flow volume loops. Um, E being uh, the fixed large central airway obstruction, F being the unilateral main stem uh, bronchial obstruction, uh, G is, um, uh, is pretty pure restriction, and H is a mixed disorder of obstruction and restriction. Uh, here are two examples of um, common spirometry errors, and this and the one on the left that is listed as obstructed airflow uh, is where you can see there's um, a tremendous amount of uh, very nonlinear flow signal, and um, it is it essentially becomes a totally unuseful piece of information um, that cannot be used for uh, <clears throat> clinical uh, treatment or. Um, any sort of idea of diagnosing what might be along with, with wrong with the patient's airways. Um, the one on the right, the poor expiratory effort, um, is the the arrow is pointing up as uh, indicating that the patient performed a poor initial effort um, that did not uh, provide an, uh, a peak flow or expiratory effort that would um, show proper. Um, degree of hyper, uh, potential hyperdynamic collapse or, or uh, just normal lung function, so it's not much use either. Uh, and the one on the left represents poor start, and that, res that results in excessive back extrapolation calcu calculations, so your, um, your mid-flow measurements and um, your FE1 are not going to be accurate. And then the one on the right represents premature termination of expiratory flow. And um, so you're not going to get an accurate FEC measurement, and your FEV1 to FEC ratio is not going to be accurate either. Uh, some considerations for testing pediatric patients, as uh, we all know that it's effort dependent. It requires cooperation and attention from the child. Age considerations are a common concern that cannot be addressed until spirometry is attempted. So you don't know uh, what you're going to get from them until you try. And um, there are some recommendations to start trying around the age of three. We generally don't start till four. Um, and we do a lot of time, a lot of building up of, uh, with the parents to do that. Um, the most difficult part of spirometry for a young child is to continue to excel. Uh, exhale once the initial blast of air con occurs. Uh, small children just don't understand how to sustain applied pressure to their chest and abdomen. Once they feel their lungs are empty, they feel like they need to stop. So that takes a lot of patience and persistence to coach out of a child. Uh, patients who are mentally delayed or not capable of following directions may not perform adequate spirometry at any age, regardless of the coach or the clinician. Patients who are not feeling well or having chest pain, for example, may follow instructions but not perform maximally. So uh, overall, and um, thanks to uh, the comments from Dr. Rosenfeld, the equally important is the experience and patience of a well-trained pulmonary function clinician. And without that, you're not going to be able to, to get your best data. Uh, just a success review, uh, introducing yourself to the patient and engaging in some conversation to try to break the ice, uh, explain and demonstrate the tests uh, as thoroughly as possible. Encourage the patient to stand or sit up straight or hold the flow sensor upright. Be expressive with body language during coaching. Change the intonation of your voice and be enthusiastic. Keep directions simple, such as take a giant breath in until you feel ready to burst and blast the air out. Repeat the testing instructions uh, when the patient does not appear to be progressing. Uh, it, it, <clears throat> be prepared to try different techniques and the open versus closed technique. Uh, it's important to offer rest periods, check in with the patient on a regular basis, make sure that they're doing okay. Um, be patient and know when to quit. Sometimes, you know, you just aren't going to get anywhere. You just have to know when to stop. So, so that, uh, you know, repeated efforts can be frustrating and counterproductive for the next visit. Um, you can't be harsh with, with anyone, especially children. 
Uh, so my summary, uh, ensure accurate use of environmental conditions of the device for calibration and operation. Ensure correct use of patient demographics. Work to optimize the FEV1 and FEC maneuver. Ensuring e, um, in, uh, EOFE so that the true FEC maneuver has been achieved. Utilizing ATS ERS grading systems to assess a spirometry test session. And being uh, f familiarized with what is a normal versus abnormal flow volume loop efforts. And work to employ data quality strategies and considerations. Uh, those are references and questions and answers and I apologize for the interruptions. So I have a quick question Jim and that, yes, sir. Uh, um, apparently much like your testing uh, software our testing software is not uh, race, news, race neutral and, and I'm not sure when we're going to switch um, although I think that we should especially in, in light of Dr. Weiner's presentation does your center have any plans for uh, changing to a race neutral testing software? Uh, yes, sir. Um, we do. And um, that is um, based on uh, our institution's um, uh, transition to that particular um, software version, which um, is also used by Ms. Kalser at her institution. And uh, that has not been done yet. Uh, our, our problem at our institution, which may be at some other institutions, that we're still mixed with an adult facility. And so um, we, we have a shared uh, database. Um, so um, any changes in normative equations um, have to be done in a blanket way. Um, so that is a bigger problem for us than I think that maybe it might be for some purely pediatric institution, but we do have a plan to transition, yes. And I, I think this might be our, our last question before our next uh, presenter. Um, can you explain the difference between open and closed techniques in spirometry? So the, um, the open technique is going to be um, in a device that um, only uh, works by um, bl um, blowing into it. And um, the, cl the close is where the patient stays completely on the mouthpiece while they're, while they're doing the technique. So, um, which of course, most of us prefer. We want that's the, 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 the technique where we can get the patient to relax on the, on the machine and um, get them to breathe tidily so that we can judge better when it's time to get them to inhale the TLC and do their, their FEC maneuver. Um, and staying, and then you know, followed by the maximal inhalation, um, especially you know, if we're interested in their inspiratory loop. So that that would be the the closed technique versus the open. And um, and do you report the uh, the grade of their spirometry on the report? Um, not currently. That's also something that we're going to be needing to work on and transition to. But that's a super good question and something that. Um, I'm hoping to, to work on as um, during this next uh, phase of our uh, changes in our software. All right. Well, well, thank you, Jim. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to apologize for not saying the people's names that asked the question. I kind of blew it there. I'd like to invite our next speaker. Dr. Parem is a pediatric pulmonologist at the Children's Health in Dublin, Ireland. She earned her Master's of Science in Evidence-Based Healthcare from Oxford University and her PhD from RCSI, where she focused on investigating the clinical utility of the LCI in children with CF. I personally had the privilege of working with her uh, when she completed her fellowship training at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, including a one-year clinical CF fellowship. Earlier this summer, she made the decision to return to Dublin to continue her career. Such a bittersweet feeling for me, Lucy. It's great to see you again. Please join me in welcoming her um, for our final presentation. Thanks for the really warm welcome, Blythe, and I miss working with you too. Um, so a little bit of a change of tack here. Uh, I'm going to talk about some novel lung function techniques. And my bio probably gave away that one of the things I'll be talking about is going to be the lung clearance index. I have nothing to disclose. 
So I'm, I'm going to frame my talk with uh, just a little bit of a, uh, a short case. This is a little girl also called Lucy, uh, a six-year-old girl at the time, Delta, um, homozygous for Delta 508 mutation, meconium ileus uh, diagnosed at birth and then subsequently diagnosed with CF by newborn screening. She was commenced on Orcambi um, at age two years. Uh, in her young life, she had no um, hospitalizations for pulmonary exacerbations. She isolated Pseudomonas on one occasion when she was two years of age. She had the usual frequent viral infections that we encounter in our preschool population and approximately averaged around two to three courses of oral antibiotics per year for these infections. Um, she generally had relatively poor adherence with chest physiotherapy and her twice daily hypertonic saline was described as the boss of the household. And nothing about this case is particularly remarkable. This is, this is sort of a, a fairly common scenario that we see, I think, um, in our clinical setting. Um, so she first attempted spirometry at age five. Um, her predicted FEV1 was on the lower side, but, you know, the technique wasn't great and you know it wasn't sure that this was her the best that she could do at our center we perform routine ct chests um, at six uh, to um to get a measure of structural lung disease and unfortunately for this little girl um at the time uh of her chest ct we were quite disturbed and shocked to see the extent of the lung disease on her ct scan uh, this came as a shock to her care team and to the family. Um, and so looking back on the case, we're like, well, what were the indicators? What could we have done differently? Um, and it really is sort of, to me, emphasizes the need to have tools uh, to for early detection of children who um, are uh, progressing in structural lung disease. And that may not be clinically evident. And we know that children often do have um, lung disease in the absence of daily symptoms and signs. So why are lung function outcomes important? Um, well, we want to detect uh, early functional abnormalities, as I've just suggested, uh, especially when they are progressing over time. Uh, when we detect them, then we can intervene with uh, new therapies with the, the goal of, um, of preventing irreversible lung damage. Once we start new therapies, then we want to assess whether these therapies are working um, and uh, um, assess treatment efficacy. And then in this new highly effective modulator area, everyone is interested to know when can we withdraw? When can we reduce treatment burden for our families? And having safe ways to do that with lung function outcomes. Um, as we've discussed a lot today, FEV1 has been the workhorse, the backbone of respiratory medicine and CF care for a very long time. Uh, FEV1, as shown in this early paper from the early 90s, is directly linked to uh, morbidity and mortality in patients with cystic fibrosis. We use FEV1 not only as a, a tool in clinic to help us make treatment decisions, but we track cohorts of CF patients over time and we can see the progress that we're making using this outcome measure. Um, and it still has incredible relevance um, for our population. But we also have to acknowledge its limitations. Um, it is a forced maneuver and requires coordination and young children can struggle with this particularly. Um, we now know that uh, most children have FEV1 within the normal range, which is fantastic. And so in a way, we are victims of our own success because we know that children can have um, structural lung disease and, um, in, with a normal uh, or even super normal FEV1. Um, at this conference, we've presented uh, in poster 112 a little bit of preliminary data showing that, you know, over 322 uh, patient encounters, the vast majority of which acceptable and repeatable spirometry data was available, providers are looking for more information about lung function to guide and inform their decision making in the majority of cases. So there is a need for more sensitive information about lung function. And so the two tests that I want to just touch on today, uh, the multiple breath washout test, which I'm sure many of you have come across in other sessions at this conference, because uh, it is an established research tool, but I want to talk a little bit about the evidence for it and potentially its clinical applications and just briefly touch on uh, impulse oscillometry. So 
The multiple breath washout test, um, in effect, measures how efficiently a gas is cleared from the lungs. And this um, simple diagram um, uh, outlines the nitrogen multiple breath washout technique. Simply, um, a young child will have a face mask, an older person will have a mouthpiece. And at the beginning of the test, they are switched from breathing normal room air to breathing 100% oxygen. It's a normal tidal breathing test, so no force manoeuvres are required. And what we are measuring is uh, as they breathe uh, oxygen, 100% oxygen, we're looking at the clearance of the resident nitrogen glass, uh, gas within the lungs and how long it takes to clear that gas. And as opposed to um, spirometry, which is measuring large and medium airway function and size, uh, the multiple breath washout test is looking at small airways disease. And we know that this is where CF lung disease begins in the small airways, uh, where mucus accumulation and inflammation um, um, are present. And this is what is detected by the multiple breath washout test. Um, this is an example of the washout curve that we would see when the test is done. And so you can see the decay over time of the uh, nitrogen concentration as the subject breeds 100% uh, oxygen. Um, for uh, a, a normal, healthy subject, the test is quite quick and will terminate here when they, when they breathe out to a pre-specified concentration of nitrogen uh, by convention, uh, usually two and a half times the start, 2.5% of the starting concentration. However, for a subject who has uh, obstructive lung disease, uh, and have inefficient um, gas mixing within the lungs, it takes a lot longer to wash out than the resident nitrogen. And so the test is longer. The lung clearance index is the primary outcome measure of the multiple breath washout test. So you can think of it like the what FEV1 is to spirometry, the LCI is to the multiple breath washout test. And unlike FEV1, where a drop in FEV1 signals worse lung function, with the lung clearance index, an increase in the LCI signals worse lung function. And it is uh, measure, It is calculated as the cumulative expired volume of gas during the test divided by the functional residual capacity um, of the subject. So going to just uh, look at a little bit of the evidence for this tool and why we think it could be something that would uh, transition to clinical care. So this is a, uh, a prospective multicenter observational study that took place in North America, uh, published in a pre-modulator era in 2017. And here you can see that there are children with, it was children with CF enrolled, 78 of them, and aged matched healthy controls. And at baseline, we see that the LCI is abnormally high on average in the CF group and within a normal range in the healthy control group. And then the LCI was repeated at multiple time points over a one year period. And we see that in the CF cohort, there was a gradual increase in the LCI or worsening, whereas the uh, LCI was stable in the healthy control group. And this was not mimicked by FEV1 in the, the preschool FEV1 measurement. And so we see that LCI can be used to track early lung disease um, in preschoolers. Um, following on from this study, these subjects were re-enrolled in a school-age study over two years. Um, this is data published by Sanya Stanojevic in the ERJ in 2020. Um, and what we were interested in in this, um, in this follow-on study was, if we look at the first preschool measurement when the child was between three and, and six years old, could we predict what their lung function would be when they reach school age? And we looked at various different clinical parameters. But the fact that the factors that were most important was the preschool LCI measurement and the rate of change of LCI over the preschool period in terms of predicting not only LCI, but also FEV1 at school age. And so we know that the period before and during school age is a critical window for interventions to modulate the progression of lung disease. Um, Another common scenario in the clinic is children who present with a new or worsening cough um, and some other respiratory symptoms, but you know, generally uh, look fairly well and typically have a viral illness. Do we treat these events with antibiotics um, or do we just let them take their natural course and let them recover on their own? Um, so this was, this data is also from that uh, one year 
preschool longitudinal study. And what we found in this study is that with these sort of relatively minor um, acute respiratory events, we see that the LCI significantly increases or worsens um, both with the events that were treated with antibiotics and with the events that uh, the provider deemed to be uh, relatively minor and not require antibiotic therapy. But at follow-up, it was only the events that were treated with antibiotics that actually had a reduction or normalization of their LCI to baseline values. So what this is telling us is that LCI can not only detect lung function worsening with these events, but it can also detect treatment effects. And then we looked at this in the school age population and we saw a similar story that LCI was more sensitive to the milder acute respiratory events, although FEV1 also deteriorated or worsened with these events. But at follow up, um, LCI was more sensitive. So LCI was really originally developed um, as a research tool with the hopes that it would be a sensitive outcome measure in clinical trials. And that has transpired. And through um, a lot of observational data showing the robust clinometric properties of the LCI, its repeatability, its re reproducibility, um, led to its adoption as a primary outcome measure in clinical trials. And this is just one example. This was the SHIP study uh, looking at hypertonic saline in preschoolers published in 2019, showing a significant significant treatment effect in children in preschool children treated with hypertonic saline compared to placebo, which was normal saline. And significant treatment effects um, for LCI have also been shown in, um, in studies with highly effective modulator therapies, um, with Dornase Alpha and others. So it is also an effective way to assess treatment effects. Um, so in North America, um, as most of you will know, the LCI is still remains in a research domain. But in Europe and other parts of the world, um, it has been used as a clinical tool for quite some time. And this is a very nice paper from a Swedish group which have been using LCI clinically for nearly two decades. And what they found is they measured LCI annually in children six years and older and had a CT chest performed on a three year basis. And what they found was that children who had low and stable LCI measurements had a much lower risk of having structural lung disease on CT and having progression of their structural lung disease on CT, whereas children who had a higher or increasing rate of LCI over time were at much greater risk of bronchiectasis and structural lung disease. And so these authors in this paper concluded that, uh, it, that clinical use of LCI and tr with the goal of maintaining a low and stable LCI um, is a worthwhile pursuit. So back to this, my little patient. So um, she was switched from Orkambi to, e to Alexacast for Tezacafter, Ivacafter at age eight years. And she saw a wonderful and dramatic increase in her FEV1 uh, from the mid 60s to about 100%. And that's fantastic. But when you measure her LCI, it's still within the abnormal range. So this is a child who still has structural lung disease, who still has abnormal lung function, but that's no longer captured on FEV1. And so while the focus of some of what I've said so far has been around the preschool years and the early children, I think um, this is also relevant for adults with normal FEV1 moving through time, that we are going to need more sensitive outcome measures to capture their lung disease. So um, just to summarize the clinical applications of LCI, it can potentially identify people at higher risks of structural lung defects and disease progression and identify those at lower risk um, of disease progression who can be managed with less treatments, who can spend less of their time doing onerous CF treatments. And isn't that wonderful? We can identify um, acute respiratory events which are associated with lung function worsening and that warrant more uh, intensive treatments. And then once we start treatments, we can monitor for treatment effects. But there's work to be done. Uh, the story hasn't finished there. Um, and so there are some, I don't know if anyone was here listening to Felix Ratchin's talk yesterday. Uh, there are plans to design um, a diagnostic utility study for LCI in North America, which will uh, more systematically um, understand the impact of using LCI on treatment decisions. Um, there's also some work to be done to simplify this test, make it accessible to people across North America in terms of training, point of care assessment of quality, um, 
and how to interpret the test. Um, there's also issues around different devices for the test, some of which are FDA approved and some of which are not. And so there is work to be done to ensure that this is a reimbursable test, which is really the key thing to transitioning it to clinical care. Um, and thankfully, uh, again, thank to Sanya Sinojevic, who's done Trojan work in the um, in developing reference equations uh, with GLI for, for FEV1 um, and spirometry outcomes. Um, similar work is also being done, being done for LCI. So that will be a huge boost to be able to use this test clinically. Um, so I'm going to just touch on oscillometry, um, but spoiler alert, um, it really doesn't have the same robust um, um, evidence um, in the CF realm at least, um, but um, but it's still worth mentioning because it's a research tool that is being used. It's, um, it's in a lot of published um, research studies and it's worth um, knowing a bit about. So um, impulse oscillometry, um, it uses the forced oscillation technique where a simply put, um, a loudspeaker at the mouth generates sound waves that are superimposed on normal tidal breathing. Um, and the a pressure transducer um, at the mouth uh, measures changes in pressure and flow. And this enables us to calculate changes in lung mechanics, specifically measuring changes in resistance to airflow and lung reactants or compliance. Um, it has a number of advantages. Um, both MBW and oscillometry, they're both tidal breathing techniques, which means you don't need a forced maneuver. Um, but um, oscillometry in particular is really quick. Um, so in some ways, even more feasible in the in the clinical setting than MBW. Um, requiring just passive patient cooperation. There's FDA approved devices, uh, there's published technical standards for it, for its use, and there's also some promising work in home-based techniques. In asthma, there's probably uh, the most robust evidence for this technique, um, where it can differentiate from healthy subjects uh, to those with um, airways disease, such as preschool wheeze. Um, there's evidence that it is can be more effective than spirometry at predicting asthma control in children. Um, and there's utility in predicting which preschool children with asthma um, will have spirometry defects at school age. So, um, so certainly something in an asthma which um, is quite promising. Unfortunately, the evidence is not quite there um, when it comes to um, cystic fibrosis. Um, now, there was a study in 2015 which showed that FOT values differentiated between health and CF. Um, the values increased during CF exacerbations and decreased after treatment, which is promising. But not all studies have shown this difference between health and CF. Um, um, and disappointingly, there was a, an Australian study where children with um, markers of uh, more severe lung disease, such as increased free neutrophil elastase, infection with pro-inflammatory pathogens or structural lung abnormalities on CT scan, had actually similar um, FOT outcomes to those children without detectable lung disease, um, which suggests that it may not be able to predict, predict which children are at risk of poorer outcomes. Um, so, to summarise, um, you know, it's challenging to interpret the results of um, um, impulse oscillometry. We don't still know what a meaningful difference between measurements is. Uh, there's no robust reference equations as yet from a diverse population, and there's a lack of evidence in cystic fibrosis. So in terms of novel outcomes in CF, um, um, LCI is probably at the forefront of transitioning from an established research tool into clinical care, where it could be used to inform treatment decisions. And oscillometry um, is promising in asthma, and there may be still work to be done in CF, which uh, might support its clinical utility, but it's not quite ready for prime time. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Um, do you need to use thermic availability to assess um, the results of the oscillometry? No, it, it is a technique that can... I do. Okay. I do. I do. The doctor who gives the salbuterol. Okay. And his idea is to assess the change. Yes. Does it have to be that way? 
<laughs> so you probably know more about doing it than I do. Um, so it, it, it has been shown that it can detect a significant change in lung function with bronch bronchodilators. Um, and so that's very useful in asthma, but it doesn't have to be used with bronchodilators. Okay. So do you eat them? I don't actually read the test. No, we don't do it as a clinical test. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, breathing, what, what he's doing there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, this is a question from the app from Scott Stofan. What is your opinion on the LCI method using the gas uh, SF6 versus nitrogen washout? Thank you. Um, so there's different tracer gases that can be used. Um, just for simplicity, I described the nitrogen breath washout test. Um, there's ample evidence to support the SF6 gas. Um, it's obviously has a slightly different technique as in you need to wash in the FF6 gas and then you just breathe room air to wash it out as opposed to using the tracer gas as the nitrogen that's resident in the lungs, uh, in the air that we breathe. Um, there was always historically a difference between the two measurements. So you couldn't um, extrapolate results from an SF6 study to nitrogen breath washout. But actually with some software updates with the nitrogen breath washout method, we now realize that the two methods are actually very similar and produce very um, comparable results, which is um, very helpful. Um, some centers might find it difficult to, um, to source the gas. So that's another issue, whereas it's very easy to get oxygen and room air. And uh, this is a question from uh, German Ezekiel Rodriguez. Boy, I need our readers. Novea. Have you been able to correlate whether patients with altered LCI and normal spirometry have a higher incident of exacerbations? That's an awesome question. Um. So, so, so I suppose LCI or a high LCI or a low FEV1 are markers of more severe disease. And so by extension, we know that people with more established CF lung disease are more at risk of more severe exacerbations, hospitalizations, lack of recovery of lung function after exacerbations. Um, but uh, the LCI can has um, some utility in predicting exacerbations. Uh, this was shown um, in a study lo looking at IV treated exacerbation and was replicated um, in our two year observational study where children with higher LCIs um, had an increased risk of um, having more exacerbations in the subsequent year. I don't know if that fully answers the, the question. Okay. Okay. Th thank you, Dr. Parem. I'm going to take this opportunity to also invite the other three speakers up just for a shorter group discussion. And there is one more question, but we can kind of address it to the group as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Here's your voice. Very good. It's awesome. I think it's best I've ever had for PhD. This question is from Darlene Kauser. And uh, any idea when LCI will be FDA approved for clinical use in the U.S.? <laughs> Million dollar question. Um, Literally. Yeah. yeah. We are hoping that. Um, so it's a bit of a tricky. So there, there are different devices, some of which are FDA approved. Um, I don't I don't subscribe or <laughs> advertise any specific device, um, but certainly one of the devices which would be the most commonly used um, across the TDN in vertex studies and in interventional trials and in investigator led studies, um, that specific device which is most commonly used is not currently FDA approved. Um, that's the Ecomedics device. Um, it just has received approval in Europe. 
And so I understand that the plan is now for the company to go for FDA approval. And that would certainly make all of our lives easier if it was FDA approved and then would, could become a reimbursable test. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there other questions from the live audience for any of the four speakers or discussion points you wanted to raise? Feel free to use the microphone, please. Um, yeah, I mean, we switched maybe close to a decade ago uh, to using Z-scores, and I think you know one of the advantages is that the normal range of Z-scores is, is is the same for any parameter on the report, and that's not true for percent predictance. So I think there's a huge advantage. It's it's sort of a little bit of a culture shift to get people to used to doing it. There are some things like some of the graphics on the report that show um, the normal distribution or where the z-scores fall on a, on a little box plot sort of uh, can help. Um, I just sort of think at, at some point we may have to bite that bullet and push your, and push your physicians along. Do you have, do you have other thoughts, Margaret? Yeah, it's a, a topic near and dear to both of our hearts and we're both have been and will be on task forces that are trying to make the switch more um, intuitive because it really isn't intuitive. So as Daniel said, it really is a culture shift. But the, the main reason for the shift is that um, the percent predicted means different things for different parameters, but also for different people, particularly by age. So 80% predicted means something entirely different for a six-year-old than a 50-year-old. And the Z-score gets rid of all that. It's probably most important for longitudinally following somebody over time or for longitudinal observational like cohort studies, but it, it we just somehow have to I think our, um, uh, we need to work harder to help make the interpretation of z-scores easier, I think mostly through graphical representation, and I think there's going to be a task force that's going to try to take that on. I'm sure you've seen the relatively new report, Daniel showed a picture of it in his presentation, that has the z-scores down below. Oh, for a lot of us, that doesn't translate into our EPIC software, and so that needs to change, but we, we somehow need to be better able at uh, facilitating understanding that change both for um, healthcare providers and for our patients. I mean, to draw an analogy, you know, in the GI world, they went to Z sport also within the last decade, and they have adapted it very easily. The cardiologists, well, too, I think, on echo reports. And, and also, I would yeah. say it's easier for pediatricians because the growth grids are Z scores. Yeah. It's harder for our adult colleagues. Uh, First of all, thank you all. And um, I had a question about for LCI. What is the youngest age that you recommend using LCI? And then is it different for the nitrogen washout versus the other form you described? So in terms of the technique where you've got an amenable subject who will tolerate a face mask and breathe normally through it, um, the youngest age is usually around three. I think two and a half is the absolute lowest that I, certainly in our center, that we've managed to do it. And that's with distraction techniques, two very qualified um, uh, RTs or people who could perform the test um, to sort of let the kid watch a cartoon and really get relaxed and have a normal breathing pattern because they're awake and alert. Um, Younger than that, it's it's challenging. There is infant MBW, which can be done unsedated in very small babies, and then with sedation up to maybe 18 months, maybe at the outset. Between that and three, it's a bit of a black box because they're sort of too old to sedate and too young to to kind of comply. Um, but so three, but it's still challenging at three, and so your you know your hit rate or success rate can be on the lower side. I mean, it could be. 60% in kind of the real world, and 80% in maybe research studies with very skilled operators. Um, and obviously with practice and experience, that number can increase. And how often does that typically take? Good question. Um, so typically you do three trials, three acceptable trials, so a little bit akin to spirometry. Um, each trial can take maybe about five minutes, but the whole testing procedure can take 
20 to 30 minutes and kind of when it's done very routinely and, and skilled. Um, but in young child, in a young child, it could take up to 45 minutes to an hour. So it is a bit of a time commitment. And that's why part of transitioning LCI to clinical care is about really thinking carefully about how do we maximize feasibility of this test to adopt it to the clinical setting. If you're doing a research study, you want the absolute most accurate um, measurement and you do it in a very scientific, well, everything scientific, but um, <laughs> but clinically, you might need to um, look at other parameters, for example, in shortening the test to an LCI 5 instead of an LCI 2.5, which there's good data to support using that. So you basically truncate the test at an earlier time point. Um, so there's different methods of thinking about it, um, but yeah. Hello. Thank you all for the wonderful talks. My question is for Mr. Norton. Thank you for your great overview on PFTs. Um, my question might be very basic, but I would like to have your input on that. Can you explain what the importance of a good peak flow on, um, on PFTs and how that affects results in the setting of normal FEV1s? Like, do you expect to have an abnormal FEV1 if you repeat the study with a better peak flow in terms of airway dynamics? Do you expect that or would yes. you Yes. Yeah, it's, just, it's my experience if you don't get um, an effort with, a, with an adequate peak flow or optimal peak flow that you're not, there's there's many cases where you will not be able to appreciate the significance of uh, the hyperdynamic um, sort of, of characteristic that you can see in a patient who provides you with an, with a, um, an, a, an effort of adequate force of, you know, with a good um, uh, peak flow measurement. Um, patients who just kind of give you maybe 75 or 80 percent of the effort, it, it rounds off that peak flow point and it often also does not allow for you to see the um, any concavity uh, or very little concavity uh, compared to what, as, uh, what they would create if they were to exhale more forcefully. So that's, you know, always something that you want to strive for is, is to get that good blast of air um, so that uh, if, if there is any hyper, um, hyperdynamic uh, sort of characteristic in their airways, you're going to see it more readily and it will create a better baseline or benchmark for you to uh, perform any um, post, you know, any sort of challenge type tests like the uh, bronchodilators so that you can really, you know, it's, it's, so you can compare, I call it comparing uh, oranges to oranges and that's, that's why it's important. So, but even if you have a normal FEV1 and you repeat the study, you would not expect to have a lower FEV1. I mean, if you if you still if you have a if you have a normal FEV1, yes. but it's not a good peak flow. Right. If you repeat that study, it, you won't expect to have. I mean, it helps show, like you said, the um, concavity and you know having a right. better baseline. But would mm -hmm. would it be different if you repeat it with a better peak flow? It may or may not change much i mean it might be a little bit different but i wouldn't you know i wouldn't expect for it to be um significantly greater but i would if it was you know not if it was not of adequate force um so it's but it wouldn't be worse it, it it um sorry i'm just asking because i've been confused and i haven't had a great like research answer on that when i tried to search the literature like that's okay. How important that is. Yeah, I'm. I'm so, now I apologize if I'm not uh, no interpreting it correctly, but just okay. you know, just the bottom line is that mm -hmm. you know, at least for me, and I think for most of us that perform spirometry, we uh, always you know try to perform it in a way that it that it uh, they are being tested in accordance with ATS criteria, so that we mm -hmm. we get the baseline that we need, and hypothetically, unless they've had unless they have a, a change. Uh, and their respiratory health, you know, if you're talking about you know, when, when they repeat it, um, you know, that's if we got normal spirometry at one clinic visit and, and, and they had a decline in the next visit, then, you know, we know that that, that also is an indication that they've um, had a compromise in their lung health. So it's, it's really all about, you know, making sure that you do it correctly yes. each time. So that you can you can rely on on the data that you're getting. Sure. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for asking. Appreciate your kind remarks. 
And just wrap things up, thank you very much to the audience for your participation and engagement in this session. I also want to thank again our speakers, Daniel, Margaret, Robert, and Lucy for enriching our minds today and providing us with such amazing information. Thank you very much.